today, here with me is Keenan Weirbach. Keenan is the founder, CTO, and product architect of Zipline, the world's first drone service that delivers life-saving medicines to the most difficult to reach places on earth. Welcome, Keenan. Thank you. Great to be with you here, Peter. It's so good to uh, see you again, Keenan. It's been such a long time. We used to spend a lot of time together back at Stanford in our PhD days, and you're working on completely different things than I remember. Like the first time I heard of you and saw you was all of a sudden this robot existed at Stanford <laughs> that was on wheels and had two arms and had a, a head, and it was just like, wow. This is so new and, and really what I've been hoping to work with forever and all of a sudden it exists. Awesome. Wow. Bringing back the good memories from the old days. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That was quite the surprise. Um, and of course, um, right now you're in a completely different situation. You're, you're, you're not, not a PhD student at Stanford anymore. Um, you're, you founded Zipline and actually spent most of yesterday watching all the Zipline videos that I could find. And it's absolutely amazing what you've been achieving there. Um, but before we get to, to those achievements and, and what's going on at Zipline, I'm curious, uh, where, where did you grow up and how was the path to get to that moment when you founded Zipline? I grew up in California uh, on a little lake uh, in the, in the uh, yeah, in a, this awesome little lake. <laughs> like spent all, spent all my time swimming, sailing, little, little rafts we would build, like, yeah, just doing all kinds of fun stuff. And how, how do you go from growing up, you know, enjoying life at a lake to, to founding Zipline? I've always, I've always been drawn to kind of like, first of all, like building stuff, taking stuff apart, like. That's just, I don't know. That's just what I did for fun all the way. Even when I was a little kid, that's just, I was, if there was, if I get my hands on a screwdriver, I'd take something apart and, you know, <laughs> get in good trouble for it. Usually depending on what it was, uh, that was just like, I don't know. There's something about like just knowing how things worked and knowing what was inside and knowing sort of mm -hmm. what was behind the scenes. That was always just a big part of just the fun for me. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the other thing that really, as I, yeah, even in high school, I really enjoyed just, if there was a problem that I thought mattered, like I had to be passionate about it. But once I thought it mattered, like, you know, you, like that was just, that was also just where the fun came from. Mm -hmm. And I think even, even in school, I spent a lot more time working on things I was excited about than like, you know, homework or classwork and things like that. Uh, and yeah, I don't know that, that being passionate about things that mattered and working on them got me through school and high school and college and grad school really effectively. And, and I often joke with, uh, well, I think even back when we were at Stanford, like I, I was spending more time building that robot than I was in like doing my classwork. And like, it was just always, because I thought it mattered. I thought it really mattered to try to build a, a kind of a common platform for robotics development. Uh, and I thought it just mattered more than like the classes I was taking that day. So, yeah. I, I can tell you as a professor, I think the hardest part of being a professor and advising PhD students is to make them realize that the classes don't matter anymore. And it sounds like you completely mastered the classes don't matter thing pretty early on. I mastered it too early. And I like there, there were times I had to like, you know, kind of get out of that. So I'd actually pass my classes. <laughs> Now, when you say you love taking things apart, I can't help but wonder if there were any, any days where you took something apart and uh, you got really stressed out that you couldn't put it back together and somebody would be really uh, upset about it. One of my favorite memories was a printer. And it was, this was back in the days when laser printers were really expensive and mm -hmm. it broke. Uh, and of course, like, you know, there were no manuals. And I, 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 think I was pretty sure as to what broke. There was this little thing you could see down in the middle of the printer that just uh -huh. mechanically broke. And I thought, how hard could this be? And I still remember, like, I had parts strewn from that printer around my parents' house. This was in high school. You know, mm -hmm. each one labeled, there were probably like 300 parts. I had to take apart just to get at that one part I saw. And uh, that stressed me out pretty good because I, you know, <laughs> by the time I got it all back together, I wasn't 100% sure. But it actually did work. And oh, it wow. actually actually worked at the end of the day. Um, it uh, didn't work quite as well as, you know, brand new, but <laughs> it printed, <laughs> which it wasn't doing before I took it apart. So. That's, that's an awesome story. I don't. I, I never managed to take things apart that thoroughly, uh, or even when I did, I don't think I ever managed to put them back together. So that's that's pretty amazing. Another great story that comes to mind is like my first like near death experience from rapid unscheduled disassembly mm -hmm. of something I built. 
Uh, and that was in high school, or I wanted to break the Newtonian physics record for how far you could throw a, 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 a golf ball. Uh, uh-huh. And so I built this catapult thing with, you know, big old winch to tension everything down. It did break the record, but then I wanted to break that record. And in the process of tensioning this thing, to picture a structure built out of two by fours, right? So, uh-huh. you know, maybe 20 feet tall with the arm up high. So that built out two by fours. But anyway, so tensioning this thing, I mean, firing it with it over tensioned, it blew up. And it blew up to the point where there was like splinters of two by fours stuck in the tree I was staying next to, like, like full on, they just flew <laughs> off and stuck in the tree. And I remember thinking to myself, like, okay, if that had hit me, I'd probably be dead. <laughs> wow. And uh, yeah, that, was, that was a pretty formative experience too. You've been taking things apart, building things ever, ever since you're born, it sounds like. But then at some point, you decided Zipline is, is the company you, you want to build. What is Zipline and, and, and why, why did you want to start Zipline? Sure, sure. So, so Zipline is all about access to medical supplies. And it's, uh, you know, at, at our technology core, we're a drone delivery company, uh, but really that's not why we exist. And this is something that, that I did for the first time professionally at Zipline, which was didn't touch the technology until we actually went out in the world and found customers and were convinced that they really wanted this thing. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, re- that's why I answer that question that way. Because a lot of people assume we're an AI company or we're a drone company or a robotics company. or we're t- and, w- and don't get me wrong, we, we are at a certain level. Um, but we, w- we exist today because of our customers. And I, say, I don't mean that in some way weird, like we, we exist to serve them. Like literally we would have failed as a company if we didn't find those customers first. Because what we wanted to do initially was not useful. Like we would not have made a successful business if we hadn't brought customers in at the beginning to really guide to us what we're doing. So tell me about that journey. The company started because of the customers. Well, when did you run into the people you're helping? Like, what, what, what's the story there? Yeah, yeah. So, so after, uh, so I spent about seven years on something you you know about well, <laughs> Ross slash Willow Garage, and and uh, too. Mm-hmm. had a wonderful had a wonderful journey there. Uh, but at a certain point, uh, once 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 the open source robotics foundation was off to the races, you know, I, I was done with that, um, and really wanted to find my, a next thing to do. Um, and, uh, and, and to be clear, not done with it because I wasn't having fun, but done with it because it was in better hands than I, I was providing, <laughs> uh-huh. and, uh, as, as you know, I think, well, well. So, um, and, and, and this, was actually, this was actually sort of a bit of a soul-searching moment because I, I knew I liked to work on things that I think mattered, and I thought Ross mattered a lot. I thought PR2 mm-hmm. mattered a lot, um, and, and that's why like, I got so into it and had so much fun doing it. Um, and along the way, I'd worked on lots of things that scaled uh, from a business perspective better than they did, mm-hmm. uh, but didn't matter very much. And, and, I, and I, just, I knew I wanted to find something that did both, something that I thought would matter and that would get me out of bed and excited, uh, mm-hmm. and something that we could solve at scale you know, through a viable business that could, you know, mm-hmm. that could really fund itself and, 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 and uh, mm-hmm. really make that work. Um, yeah. And so you know, how do we find customers? So this was, this is actually two years of my life doing random things. It was actually a funny period of my life because, because of Willow Garage, a lot of people would come to me saying, Hey, Keenan, can you help me make a robotics company? Mm-hmm. Um, and I did something which I had never done myself. I told them this advice I'd gotten and never followed, which was basically go find customers. When you have customers come back to me and you know, let's talk. Right. And as you can imagine, almost none of them came back to me. <laughs> like, uh-huh. uh, but a couple did. Uh, and it was really cool to sort of see how those companies uh, evolved. Uh, mm-hmm. And basically, I just took that time to find something that I knew would check those two boxes, met a bunch of potential co-founders, looked at all kinds of things. I, at one point with uh, with actually Keller, my co-founder here at Zipline, we actually walked away from a massive NRE check uh, from, a, from a potential path that was very different than Zipline, to be clear, didn't involve flying mm-hmm. robots or anything like that. Uh, mm-hmm. But along the way, uh, it was actually our family members um, my wife's an epidemiologist. Um, Keller has family in the public health space as well, and they kept talking to us about, "Hey, you know, at, you know, back back when we started Zipline, uh, Amazon was talking about drone delivery, right? So this wasn't like some crazy new idea at the technology, sort of like, what can you do with drones level?" Um, but uh, our fa- our family kept nudging us of like, "Hey, you're looking for things. We keep hearing about these." international vaccine campaigns. We keep hearing that fail on logistics. We keep hearing about these international efforts to, you know, eradicate various diseases or even like treat basic things like diarrhea and certain 
mm-hmm. in parts, certain parts of the world that just fail on logistics. Uh, go look at that. Um, yeah, and we did. It was awesome. We spent a bunch of time in Central America and in Africa getting to know the problem. And um, yeah, I'll be honest, I'm a pretty skeptical person. So I spent time, like I was assuming, okay, we're going to go meet these customers and we're going to learn a thousand reasons why we can't actually solve the problem. Uh, and anyway, the, the opposite happened. And so the rest is history and we went for it. And just because not everybody will know ahead of time, when you say the rest of the history, you went for it. What did you go for? What, what did you build? Yeah, sure. So, um, so the, basically, if, if you think about this from a nuts and bolts, like what our customer cares about, we do fulfillment and delivery on demand of medical supplies, right? And by the way, we started with just doing blood, right? And blood is this really special medical supply, right? It has a very short shelf life. It's rare. Everywhere in the world, you have less blood than you need. And because it has such a short shelf life, as few as seven days for certain blood products, um, mm-hmm. you, and, and there's so many blood types, you, you need to get it to the right person at the right time. Mm-hmm. And if you guesstimate where to send it, it ex- most of it will expire before it's used. Right. Um, and so th- what we built, the first thing we built was a drone delivery system that enabled us to centralize uh, blood storage in, in, in mm-hmm. basically one location and then fly very long range uh, uh, with these uh, basically small aircraft, small airplanes, mm-hmm. picture a small fixed wing drone that flies out, delivers the blood, comes back and gets the next order and does the next order of blood and on demand, right? So basically when they know what type of blood they need and how much blood they need, they would they, they request mm-hmm. that blood. And that's what we built initially. Um, we're many versions later, and now we deliver vaccines and other medical supplies mm-hmm. at much longer range and bigger scale. Um, but that's what we built. Now, one of the crazy things I saw um, when, when watching the videos on, on the technology side, right, is, well, most people when they think about drones, definitely when I think about drones, I, I think of, you know, quadcopter type drones that I might use to take some videos when I'm going for a hike and, and you know, maybe other people do it for skiing and so forth. Um, the things you, you can just buy off the shelf in a little box and, and it, it, it makes videos of you. Um, but actually, a zipline drone looks very, very different. Can you describe what, what, what it physically looks like? Sure. So our drones are, they look like small airplanes, um, about 10 foot wingspan. And uh, they, they deliver a box about the size of a cake box to kind of, kind of make it physical. Um, what do they look like? They have red wings and a, and a white body and they're launched off of a catapult um, and they land in this crazy contraption <laughs> for, for landing. Uh, but all of that is done. The re- we're, it's a fixed wing versus a quadcopter for range, which is what our customers care mm-hmm. about. Uh, it, we launched with a catapult to make the plane as simple as possible for cost, which again was what our customers care about. Uh, and landing, same thing, right? In order to have something that can fly really far, really efficiently through all kinds of storms, you basically don't want to put any complexity on the drone itself. <laughs> uh, you don't have to. So you don't want landing gear. You don't want any fancy system on the drone for landing. So we have a contraption mm-hmm. on the ground for landing. Um, and uh, yeah, that's sort of the nuts and bolts of it, if you will. And I must say, as an engineer, I was absolutely fascinated by by the way the drone takes off and lands. Is there any chance you're able to maybe Pull, pull up a video and talk us through what's, what's going on when a zipline drone takes off and lands. Because it, it's not what I think most people think of when they think of their, no, drones they have played with or when they sit in an airplane that flies them. It's, it's quite different. So at our distribution centers, we have uh, inventory on site. That's really important because we deliver you know, in a matter of minutes from an order coming in. You saw a quick version of how the order is packed. Uh, then put into the body of one of our drones. We call them zips. I might call them zips accidentally. I always forget to call them drones. Um, and uh, that goes in the launcher. You put a wing on uh, on that on that drone. Then a battery pack goes in. There's a little pre-flight process, uh, and then it gets launched. Um, and uh, this launcher is a lot of fun. This launcher has a motor and a and a, and a super capacitor bank that takes that drone uh, you saw there to zero to 110 kilometers an hour in a quarter second. Um, wow. And it's, it, it's about as much power as flooring an entry model Tesla uh, to launch wow. that plane <laughs> that fast. It just flies right by um, and it drops the package uh, during that flyby. This is slow motion now, just to be clear. I just want slow-mo mm-hmm. on you. So um, the, the package has a little paper parachute on it. Uh, this is actually a very old, this is a, this is a, one, our very first version. So this delivery box is about the size of a shoe box. Our new drones are about the size of a cake box, but it's basically the same idea. 
Um, there's actually a lot of technology behind the scenes to do that well, uh, to, to, to basically measure and estimate the wind speed and direction and compensate. So that package ends up where the customer wants it, not in the tree. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, that's what a delivery looks like. Then the, 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 the drone flies back, of course, automatically and lands in this, in this system. Uh, we kind of call this an upside down aircraft carrier. <laughs> wow. uh, and uh, the, the poles snap up and grab the plane out of the air and they'll do it even in crazy stormy conditions. And you can see what, that, that was slow-mo there. So you can see it. I'll let this loop again so you can see it. Uh, so um, am I seeing this correct, Keenan, that the plane is just flying like normal? but then it gets snatched by a cable that somehow brings it to a stop almost instantaneously? Exactly. Um, so the plane just flies by. It's actually not trying to land. It's trying to just do a, a very safe flyby. And then there's that line between those two poles and those poles will snap up right at the right moment uh, to basically throw the line between those poles into the, into the tail hook of the plane. Uh, you can see it right Amazing there. Amazing to see. Um, now, why not just have a, a regular landing? Like when, when we take a flight in a regular plane, there is, you know, the plane just lands and why not set it up that way? Sure. So, so really, 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 well, a couple of reasons. One, um, if you're looking at, so one of the things our customers care the most about is reliability, right? They want us to be able to do this day and night, storms all day long. Um, and if you look at what determines the reliability of an aircraft, you know, even passenger aircraft, one of the hardest things to deal with is what they call a hard landing. So, is you know, it's a, it's some of us have experienced them, right? Your plane's coming in and it hits the runway a little harder than you'd like, uh -huh. right? That the the mechanical stresses that come from that in your plane are very very hard to predict and model. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to to build a small aircraft, especially even a large aircraft, that will have a very predictable life in the face of hard landings. So this is designed from the ground up to not have any hard end landings. Uh, and we've shown this out past five nines of reliability, that zip will either do a flyby and come around again, which sometimes happens, uh, or, or, or have this very repeatably gentle load case right into the tail, we call it the tail boom, that, that thing at the end of the plane with a hook on it. Um, so that's one reason. Uh, cost is another. Keeping the planes very low cost is important. We're doing, you know, hundreds, we're up to hundreds of flights per day per distribution center. So we prefer to have some costs on the ground and make every drone less expensive. Um, so we can, so the economics work out for our customers. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then that storm piece is really important as well. Um, you know, just like it's, it, it basically makes our operators, they don't have to worry about what happens, right? Because a small aircraft like this on a runway, the way we land in a uh -huh. storm, literally can just blow, get blown off the runway. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, and uh, having a system like this, like it eliminates those kinds of challenges. That's amazing. That, and it's also super compact as a consequence. It seems like you need almost no space to, to set this up. Is that right? Absolutely. One of the reasons that that recovery system, we call it, that, that the landing system is so tall is so we can be right next to buildings, wherever, wherever it makes sense, uh, wherever is a good central location right next to our supply, that's where we want to set up our distribution center. One of the uh, things I noticed as I was you know, researching the latest happening at Zipline is also that you actually have Bono involved. I mean, you two's Bono. Um, what is Bono doing at Zipline? Oh, he's fantastic. So he's he's a member of our board, board of directors. Uh, fun fact: it's the only corporate board he's ever been on. Uh, and he, uh, you know, Zipline is solving like, again this. Bono has committed his career to solving some really important public health challenges, uh, and Zipline is uniquely uh, positioned to solve we think it was like the unsexy part of that, which is like, you know, the logistics, get the supplies where they're needed when they're needed uh, in a way that, well, basically has never been solved at a really global scale before. Um, and yeah, so his role is fantastic. He helps us get connections with, with the right people to, to get operating in the right places. Um, and obviously his credibility and his, um, uh, you know, he, he's just, he's done so many things in public health over the last 20 years. He helps us see around corners uh, that it was really important for the company. I agree. I mean, it's awesome to have somebody like that on board, but how do you even get them on board? Like, do you just reach out and you say, hey, I love your music and, and your other work also. And can we talk? I mean, he must be hard to reach. I mean, I think it's like, it's like anything to, in a startup, right? It's all about relationships, right? Um, 
it's all about relationships. And then over the years, we've built relationships with people he respects and, and done things that he, you know, that, that have that got on his radar screen. And, and, and that's how we connected. Yeah. Wow. So he, he was kind of aware of what you were doing uh, before you talked to him then. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like what we do, this logistics and public health is there's so few people focus on innovation there that if you mm-hmm. care a lot about public health, you've heard about Zipline for sure. How many deliveries have been done with Zips? We're well over 100,000 deliveries now. So as I get it, that's, that's counting a drone flight as, as one delivery. Because I also saw something about millions of uh, vaccines being delivered for COVID. So we've done millions of vaccines uh, pre-COVID. Uh, we will hopefully do a million vaccines uh, of vaccine deliveries of COVID here just in a matter of months. We've already done uh, tens of thousands of COVID vaccine deliveries just actually in the last week. Um, wow. We just got our, in, in Ghana, we just started delivering COVID vaccines, uh, which again, like we got our training wheels delivering, well, non-COVID vaccines. We learned, how, you know, cold chain challenges, uh, chain of custody mm-hmm. challenges. We, we were really good at that now. Uh, and then when they called us up and said, hey, can you do COVID now? Like we were ready. Uh, and now we're doing that at scale, which I am personally really excited about because, mm-hmm. you know, he, in the States, you know, my parents, I mean, it was just getting them vaccinated was just insane, right? The trying to figure out the schedules and the like, but in Ghana, that's not what's happening. We're sending directly to health clinics. Your doctor calls you up and says, Hey, I have a vaccine. Come on in. Like, that's how it should be, right? Like, that's how it should be. And someday we'll be at that level here in the U S too. Uh, but we're just so exciting to, 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 it just, it's like so obvious, right? Like if you can deliver right to the doctor, especially the doctor who knows you personally, it's just, it's just such a better health experience and just easier. And yeah, it just, it just works. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. I mean, there's some, so much logistics to be, I mean, in the U S all you hear about for COVID is the logistics right now for the vaccines and you're, you're effectively solving the core of that in Africa, which is so exciting. Yeah. And by the way, one little fun, geeky piece of it, but the big challenge with logistics with trucks is usually making big deliveries, which means you're, where you deliver to, they have to have good refrigeration or freezers, mm-hmm. right? But if you're doing on-demand delivery, so like in Ghana, we'll typically deliver enough for a couple of days, maybe even a week of supply. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the vaccine we're delivering there can even be stored in just a normal fridge for that time frame. It's wow. no challenge, right? And so it basically reduces by literally we're talking about, you know, thousands of delivery sites. So it reduces by a thousand, the number of, well, freezers you have to maintain and stuff like that, which, which just makes things easier, right? It's just way more flexible. That's amazing. Now, when, when you said you started out with solving a problem, like finding the problem you really want to solve and you started in Africa, cause that's where you saw, um, that you could really go go help by by setting up a zip line there, but Africa is gigantic. I mean, it's it's not it's not a <laughs> just a country, right? It's a, it's a whole continent. There's so many countries. Can you say a bit more about? I mean, you can't just start in Africa. You got it's got to be a more precise plan, I imagine. Yeah. Oh, I mean, the early days it was you know it was it was it was startup precise, right? So in the very early days. You know, we started basically networking and meeting with these different governments, mm-hmm. uh, some in Central America, some in Africa. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we learned very quickly that customers like this require a lot of attention. And, mm-hmm. you know, back then we were just, you know, literally five people. So we couldn't, you know, give them all the attention we needed. So we, we got started to get smarter about, okay, which of these countries we're talking to should we start with? We narrowed that down to three. Um, and, and then we, and then because we're a startup and we were trying to get a government contract, we, we knew we had to keep at least three, right? You gotta, you gotta manage your risks, <laughs> which turned out to be really, uh, uh, really important because up until maybe three months before we launched with Rwanda, our first customer, mm-hmm. uh, it was, we were sure it was going to be a different country, like up wow. until that close, but that contracting wow. process basically got stuck in the mud and had to kind of reset. Uh, and Rwanda said, hey, we want to be first. Uh, and, and that contract was going really well. And we ended up launching in Rwanda. Um, but yeah, it's, again, it comes back to the relationships, that networking. And yeah, as you can imagine, we were layering a lot of sort of technical data onto it, basically trying to figure out, you know, which, which, where were we, where were we going to be most successful? Mm-hmm. For your first customer, if it's not successful as a startup, you're in trouble. <laughs> we yeah. were looking at... Um, we were also, you know, looking at like integration challenges, you know, we make planes, right? We had to, uh, Rwanda is very high altitude country. Uh, we had to make sure we could fly at those high altitudes, uh, all kinds of interesting things like that had to be sorted out to kind of make sure we would have a good successful 
uh, launch customer. You said three countries. Rwanda is one of them. Which are the other two that you started off with? So we started out with Rwanda, Tanzania, and Costa Rica. Got it. Wow. Yeah. Now that's a bit spread out. I mean, did you physically go visit and spend time at all three places or? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and our head of business development spent a lot more time. Our head of business development was never home <laughs> in, the, in, the early, in the early years. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that was, that was very challenging. Um, yeah. But this, it was challenging, but it also wasn't that challenging. I think a lot of people think of Africa, especially as like a difficult place to travel in and things like that. I think that was probably true 20 years ago, but it's, it's easy now. I mean, you, you can get to Africa and, you know, it's pretty much like getting to, to anywhere in Asia. It's nice mm-hmm. and easy. And um, it's it, the world is nice and small. It's way smaller than you would think. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it's also a startup. So like, you know, not sleeping for the first few years is part of what you should expect to do. So I, I can attest to that. Um, <laughs> now, one thing that struck me is that when you say you start, for example, in Rwanda, it's not just that you start in Rwanda. As I understand it, you actually build a relationship with the Ministry of Health of Rwanda. So all the way at the top, can you see a bit more about that? Any country we work with, it's, th- there's a whole bunch of stakeholders that are involved, right? So there's the obvious ones like the regulators, airspace regulators, uh, and as well as the, 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 the health industry or basically the, the equivalent of like the FDA style regulator. Uh, then there's the actual public health systems that we're working with. Um, uh, and then you layer on top of that the political la- layers, right? Because right. nothing big happens in a country without political, basically, support. Right? No one, no one, no one in a public health system would take a huge risk without political support. What was so cool about Rwanda specifically is when we went in to meet with uh, the Minister of Health. Um, you know, she like. Well, we're actually worried at first because she's starting to text on her phone. We're like, "What's this all about?" <laughs> uh, we, we lost her, right? Uh, but she. In walk two economists, uh, and like from the very beginning, we we worked with those economists to literally put together a, basically a health impact analysis, as it included mm-hmm. an economic impact analysis, um, and like that was their step zero what, based on really good data that they had, uh, and they put that case together, and then once once uh, the minister of health had that, then she went to the president and said, hey, we have to do this. Right. And even later in the process, when you know, the, the Department of Defense had to sign off on sort of American drones coming, you know, mm-hmm. having her in the room saying, you got to figure this out. And here's why. Right. Here's why this is so big for us. That was absolutely huge. Um, and uh, yeah. And then from there, that's that. Then you start working through the contracting process, figuring out what you're actually going to do and how you're going to charge and mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And. And most of the countries we operate, uh, like Rwanda and Ghana, you know, you're talking about political approvals involved, right? So you have to, you have to, you have to pitch this, and you know, there's a whole process. Usually, votings are involved. It's it's pretty uh-huh. wild to get through through the other end. Yeah, but there you are. And and what I also noticed, I don't know if that's part of, of how it all played out, but when I watch the videos, it it seems you get a lot of, uh, you hire a lot of people locally. And yep. it doesn't look like you bring in a large team. You you set up shop and you start finding people locally. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, we, we actually have a place. So, so for, first of all, all of our Zipline Rwanda and all of Zipline Rwanda is run and staffed and led all by locals, Rwandans and Ghanaians. Um, and in Rwanda, we have a place that we, at our first distribution center, uh, we have a thing we call Zipline Academy. And so even our operators that are now operating here in the U.S., we send them out there to get trained, uh, and then they wow. come back here to operate. Took off so well that that's where the training happens now. Even if you yeah, I mean, this operation is, is mm-hmm. I mean, it's where you want to get trained, right? Because it's the highest volume operation. Uh, mm-hmm. It's also, I mean, it is just disciplined and elite. It's really cool mm-hmm. to see. It's the kind of thing where, like, I, there was this there's this transition when when I very first days when I was out there, right? I could help out and like pinch in the things <laughs> like that. But now when I go back and visit, I'm not allowed to touch anything. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm not certified up to the standard that they operate at. Wow, yeah. that's quite the story. <laughs> Locked out of your own uh, operations. <laughs> it's 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 yeah, it's 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 amazing. It's, amazing. it's awesome. Now, you started in Rwanda. How many countries are you operating in right now? Yeah, so today we operate in Rwanda, uh, we operate in Ghana, and we operate here in the U.S. So also in the U.S. Yep. Uh, I think I think that's less well known. 
Can, can you say a little bit about what, what's happening in the U.S.? Yeah, so our operation in the U.S. started back in May, and it was actually accelerated by COVID. Um, and uh, yeah, and to be clear, in the U.S., we're like we're like three years behind where we are in Africa in terms of scale, which mm -hmm. is uh, we'll catch up. Don't worry, uh, but we're working very closely with the U.S. regulator to get to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. We started doing. Uh, we started doing the very basics. Um, and there's actually a, there's actually some poetic uh, balance here. So as I mentioned, when we started in Rwanda, we started with blood, right? Because blood is rare, it needs to be delivered on demand right where you need it. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started in North Carolina in May during COVID, uh, mm -hmm. we started delivering PPE because it was rare. Uh -huh. It, mm -hmm. it needed to be delivered exactly where and when it was needed. Um, uh -huh. And uh, so it's a, we, we, have a, we have a known story for how we start a new country. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just unfortunately in the U.S. that meant delivering masks uh, uh -huh. and things like that to, to healthcare workers. Wow. That, that's a great story too, though. One thing I also noticed for the U.S., I don't know um, if that's the same kind of things you're delivering. It was something about Walmart mentioned in one of the articles. Yeah. So we're launching with Walmart later this year. Um, we have a handful of other, other, op other operations getting built in the U.S. right now, which is, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, Walmart's one of them. Uh, Walmart will be delivering what they call their health and wellness products initially. So this is basically what you'd expect, like a CVS pharmacy. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, it also represents a really exciting shift for Zipline, uh, which we've been going through in Africa just starting as well, which is, so in Africa, we started with hospitals and then did mm -hmm. health clinics, but now we're moving to patient home delivery. Uh, and wow. with Walmart, same thing. So Walmart already does on-demand delivery, you know, DoorDash style, we call it, you know, people in cars, and that works for, you know, five kilometers or so, maybe eight kilometers, uh, mm -hmm. but we can go, you know, 80 kilometers. Uh, and so basically we're, we're enabling that kind of on-demand pharmacy delivery to be for folks who are in just way more remote locations. Wow. Now, uh, as you've done so many deliveries at this point, um, I'm curious, are there, are there any stories that send, stand out to you of, you know, certain deliveries where it just felt, I mean, I imagine many, but some must really stand out that feel really life-changing as you do this blood deliveries, vaccine deliveries, Any, anything you could tell us about your personal sure. favorites. Sure. I have one geeky story to tell and one really, really kind of emotional story to tell. Mm -hmm. so the geeky story was fun. So our test sites are here in California and we've, mm -hmm. you know, we've been flying all day, every day at these test sites long before we started in Africa to work, you know, work out all mm -hmm. the issues in the system. Uh, but it's really important that our test sites, that the drones fly, you know, where you can see them. So they kind of do uh -huh. circles and stay near, stay where you are. Right. And so if a drone at a test site ever were to like fly over the horizon, like that's a bad thing. Like th that's something uh -huh. went wrong. <laughs> and I still remember the very first time in Rwanda, our very first uh, d d deliveries to our very first hospital. The first time I saw a drone just like take off and just disappear, like my heart just skipped a beat. And like, I was like, something is wrong. This is not right. Uh, and then of course, you know, it was a pretty short delivery, but like 10 minutes later, it comes back, it doesn't have the blood anymore. And it was like, wow, that just happened. Holy smokes. <laughs> uh, and uh, so that, that was, that was my, that was one of my more formative, like and traumatizing geeky level experiences. Um, you, have to, you have to really trust it beyond what you can see. It's exactly. It just, we just went, it just went. Um, and uh, I, one other fun, fun anecdote about that flight, this was a very beginning and we didn't want to fly in rain because we wanted to kind of ease into it. Uh -huh. uh, so we looked at all the weather data sources and said it won't rain. So we, uh -huh. but that, that plane come, came back soaking wet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and So it was like, oh, there must be some rain over the horizon we didn't know about. <laughs> anyway, um, wow. that was a fun moment. I was like, uh, but yeah, I think one of the more personal ones was meeting a woman uh, this was later that same, that first year, this woman named Alice. And she, uh, we actually ended up delivering to her twice, believe it or not. So she, we delivered to her while she was uh, having postpartum hemorrhage uh, mm -hmm. while delivering blood. Uh, sorry, while delivering a baby. She went into postpartum hemorrhage and we delivered blood for that case. Mm -hmm. uh, and then six months later, she got malaria. And one of the, one of the uh, sort of things that happens when you get malaria, it can happen is you develop anemia, which also requires blood. And so she, like, we delivered to the same woman twice. And so she had to come check us. She had to see what this was about. Uh, and so she actually came by and visited. And that was, that was a pretty surreal moment to meet somebody who, like, you know, who heard it, like, in her words, like, she's like, yeah, I heard about this crazy thing called, you know, I heard my, what is, what's a drone? <laughs> and uh, she really wanted to see what it was. So she literally just found out where we were and came by and knocked on the gate and, and, and checked it out. That was, that was, that was pretty, that was pretty special. 
Yeah, that must be amazing. And, and when you say one step removed, you're really 50 to 100 kilometers removed, right? So this, this woman came, came a long way probably to, to meet yep. you. Yep, she did. Yeah. Wow. Now, th these are great stories. I'm curious about stories that are maybe things where <laughs> you really struggled and things didn't really go according to plan. Um, and any of that, any of that are your favorites there? Yeah. Oh, struggles. So, so, so I met my wife, uh, skiing, uh, she's from Costa Rican. Uh, mm -hmm. she's a doctor and an epidemiologist anyway, skiing. So my sister, my sister, we both know my sister through Berkeley and, uh, and my wife has a P epidemiology PhD from Berkeley anyway. So she, we, on the ski weekend, we go skiing mm -hmm. and my wife had never skied before. So anyway, I basically spent the weekend teaching her to ski. And one of the things when you're learning to ski, you always tell people is you look where you want to go. Don't look where you don't want to go, right? Stare at the tree. You're, you're way more likely to hit the tree if you stare at the place that doesn't have the tree and you'll, and you'll go there. And so she made fun of me because after Willow Garage, I had this, and I was looking for my next thing I wanted to do. I had this list of things that should not be in a startup. And they included things. I had everything on the list. You don't want in a startup. I didn't want regulate, regulation. I didn't want government customers. I didn't want hardware. I didn't want safety critical. I didn't want safety critical hardware and safety critical software. And so I had this list going. And when I was telling you, after the first trips looking at Zipline, uh, looking at what became Zipline, I was like, I'm really thinking about this. And she started making fun of me. She's like, you were staring at that list too much because everything on the list of don't put in a startup is in this potential thing. <laughs> Uh, and I think it's, uh, anyway, so <laughs> I, it always makes me laugh because a lot of the really challenging things about Zipline have been in, in that world, right? Selling to governments, just really hard to do. The regulation stuff, just really, because like the, 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 we work in a regulated environment without regulations, which is like the worst, right? There aren't drone regulations that work for Zipline. So we're always, every country we go to, we're working to basically create the regulations that enable Zipline. And that's... Um, and that's been an adventure. And then, of course, all the safety critical aspects of this uh, has been really wild. All of this sounds uh, like it has many, many challenges, many layers of challenges. M maybe being an engineer in, in, in training, um, I'm really curious about the technical side um, and, and some, some challenges that you might have run into there. Because, I mean, you don't just build the drone like that. I mean, you 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 got to somehow decide what drone you even build, how you're going to build it. Um, say a bit more about that. Huh? How did sure, the zip sure. become what it, what it is now? This is fun because when we started Zipline, I actually thought I was going to buy drones and, and then maybe modify them for package delivery. And that's how we get going. Mm -hmm. And so the first kind of like, uh, let's call it rough lesson was, talking to all the drone manufacturers who could who, who could potentially make, build drones to do what we wanted to do and basically learning that none of them worked for what we wanted to do. I still remember the most, the, the closest we got to that was a drone manufacturer who wanted to charge us $200,000 a drone with a mm -hmm. 200 flight warranty if we didn't fly in the rain. <laughs> uh, and it was like, it was, it was just like so impossibly you know, useless for what we wanted to try to do uh, mm -hmm. that it was like, oh, wow, we actually have to start in order to do our first customer, we have to build a drone ourselves. Um, I remember that was one of those like wake up call moments of like, okay, <laughs> there's more work here than we thought. Can, can you contrast the 200,000 with the rough cost of, of building a drone yourself? Sure, sure. Like the, the I mean, we're, we're, our, our drones are now, it's a little hard to like describe the drone itself, but think of our drones as like low, very low tens of thousands, right? So, mm -hmm. and they also last a very long time and they fly through rain and all the time uh, mm -hmm. and they're very easy to maintain and they have a lot of other things that we could not get off the market, if you will. <laughs> uh -huh. um, yeah. Um, one really interesting technical challenge, like I, I think the... Oftentimes, like if, if you've been trained by anybody, right, in engineering, they teach you to think about risk, right? So you're kind of thinking, you're like making your list of like, what are all the things they're going to get me? Right? Uh -huh. uh, and one of those, but it, what really burns you is the things you don't really think are going to be big risks, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, one of the advantages we have is we have a plane and a plane flies really efficiently. And that's, you know, if you stand a hundred feet back from our plane, it looks a lot like all the other planes, right? In terms of mm -hmm. got a wing and a body and a tail and, you know, you're good to go. Um, 
And so, you know, one of the things we wanted to do was fly through weather. And so we went to the experts in the industry, uh, places like NASA and said, Hey, like, how do we make sure this thing can fly through weather? And they gave us their models that have been developed over many years of how to simulate and how to basically set your requirements for flying through weather. Um, and we did that. Okay. Followed all that, followed their, their recommended design practices, their requirements and so on. Uh, we went to Rwanda we started flying and it didn't work. Right. We have a parachute landing system on our drones. Uh, we were parachute landing way too often, way more often than that, that analysis and modeling suggested we could. And then we turned around and really started thinking about the problem, went back to those experts and we're like, okay, how did you build these models and so on? And it turns out we were actually doing something that basically nobody does. Nobody flies near the ground. Uh, mm -hmm in storms. Um, it's just not done in our, in our head. Even I was like, yeah, but like, you know, uh, uh, search and rescue helicopters, they must do it. So I get on the phone, literally talk to the team in the California coast guard, talk to the team on Zermatt, right? The biggest mountain in the Swiss Alps, like their rescue team. And both of them said the same thing. Oh, we don't fly in weather anymore. That was 20 years ago. Too many people died. We stopped, we stopped, we like, we wait till the mm -hmm. weather clears. Right. And so we're sitting here going like, OK, we're flying in this really interesting uh, domain that nobody flies in. Um, and uh, <laughs> anyway, so we had to go learn about this domain, develop our own models uh, and actually pretty much completely redesign our drone <laughs> to actually be able to survive in the crazy sort of updrafts and downdrafts and sort of stormy conditions that happen. And we call them energy concentrators as you have winds flying over hills and mountains, these crazy, basically energy sources, uh, we had to redesign the plane, the control system, pretty much everything to actually do this reliably like we do today. Uh, and we, anyway, those, so those are two steps. At first, I didn't even think I had to make the drone. And then I thought, well, at least NASA knows how to fly in this, in this kind of environment. So I can listen to them. And it, both of those things turned out to be uh, learning experiences. <laughs> we are dropping new interviews every week. So subscribe to The Robot Brains on whichever platform you listen to your podcasts. AI, of course, is powering many, many systems these days. And I'm, I'm curious uh, when today a zip, you know, flies off and comes back, what kind of AI is involved in that process today? Yeah. So today in operations, the, the AI in operations is mostly around weather. Um, now, there, there's no coincidence that our biggest reliability challenge today in operations is also weather. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what we've put, that's where we've put our big guns in terms of what we've really solved problems around. Um, in our development process at our test sites and things, it's around aircraft detection. Uh, and then soon it's going to be around things like ground obstacle detection uh, and delivery site selection and getting that package right where you want it uh, on your mm -hmm. doorstep. Well, one of the things that happened kind of in during, I mean, Zipline already existed, but kind of started happening last five years really is. Um, AI has really broken through and gotten a lot of new capabilities that weren't possible before and image recognition, speech recognition and so forth, right? And, and all powered under the hood with, with deep learning. And I'm very curious if, you know, deep learning plays a role at Zipline now or wh what, what do you see kind of the future of deep learning in the context of Zipline? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this, this comes back. So, so AI in general's role at Zipline is growing. So in the past, it's only been offline and that's been very intentional because I was dreading having to explain, you know, AI basically to regulators uh, in, in the early days, because it was already hard enough to explain the more, way more sort of deterministic stuff we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, but this, the, uh, AI has a big role in the future of flying for us. Uh, and it's really connected to that, that march we're going down, starting with hospitals, health clinics, and now patient home delivery, right? Because mm -hmm. with hospitals from one distribution center, you know, maybe 10 to 20 hospitals we can reach. Mm -hmm. Depends where you are in the world. Health clinics, you know, now we're talking about 1,000 health clinics. But now that we're doing patient home delivery, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of delivery sites from one mm -hmm. distribution center. And so a lot of the things we did uh, that, that make economic sense and scale for those, those, those uh, for health clinics and hospitals don't make sense anymore and really aren't going to create the customer experience we want. Uh, mm -hmm. for this next level of operation. So, uh, and, and really it comes down to things like, well, detecting and avoiding other aircraft, uh, detecting and avoiding uh, ground obstacles, you know, cell towers and power lines and trees and things like that. Uh, and then uh, the last place also related to perception that we're working hard on is really around the delivery experience and being able to get 
dealing uh, dealing with that. You know, the people want their deliveries in their backyards uh, from drones, mm -hmm. and so being able to actually na sort of navigate, if you will, and find a good delivery place in their backyard that's going to mm -hmm. work and be safe. Uh, this is a big part of where we're going with it. Um, and, and so uh, I can I'll talk a little more about that in a second. The other place that we've we're using deep learning and machine learning is actually weather forecasting. Oh, we have our yeah. we have our own weather forecasting. We call it now casting because we care about like basically what's right in front of the drones, and we mm -hmm. feed data in from satellites and from our mm -hmm. drones to guess. Uh, there's basically a very particular type of weather event we can't fly through. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called a microburst, and so what we really want to. Oh, okay. what's a microburst? So microburst is what happens right at the beginning of a thunderstorm. When that thunderstorm head forms, um, you end up with this huge updraft and, and then outside of a downdraft. When I say huge updraft, I'm talking like, it, we, we have recorded data at like 40, 50 meters per second of the, the vertical component of the wind on wow. the middle and on the outside, it's you know coming down. Um, and uh, well, let's just say that's more than our drones can handle. Then that if we if we often not every time often if we end up in those we end up parachute landing the drone. Um, mm -hmm. And so being able to forecast those has been something that that we actually end up rolling ourselves because this is another one of those things that we care a lot about. Uh, it's a very one of these near ground effect uh, things. Uh, and it turns out the, the rest of the weather industry isn't working on it. So uh, uh, the, br the brilliance of AI today, one really good engineer uh, has, has made a huge impact on this for, for Zipline already. I'm kind of curious because when we think about AI, if we talk about this specific one for a moment. Sure. It's like the typical model is that you, you collect data, you have observations, and then the AI, often a neural network, has to turn those observations coming from satellites, radar, and so forth, turn that into a prediction. Yep. But the way it's, it's trained is by also having access to ground truth predictions that you, you have as examples. And so it seems almost like a chicken and egg problem because you, you got to predict those, you got to find those microbursts so you can collect your data. So you can say a little bit about that. Sure. So th th there's basically three ways that we, there's sort of three sources of ground truth for this problem that we use. Mm -hmm. One source of ground truth truths are our historical logs from every flight we've ever done. Mm -hmm. uh, places where we've flown into microbursts or flown near them. Because uh, mm -hmm. if you're right in the center, it's, it's one thing, but if you're near them, you can still see the sense them. That's one oh. source. Uh, the other source is is historical satellite imagery, right? So you know you, you have the satellite you have the satellite imagery, and you can actually these microbursts have very unique uh, they look very unique visually in these in this imagery, and so you can see when it happens, and then you try to train a model on basically what came before. Uh, you try to predict based on what came before when it's about to happen, uh, and then there's another thing we've been using, which is basically. Um, so computational fluid dynamics, right? Let, let's you sort of build like a sort of a 3D model uh, mm -hmm. of how the wind moves over surfaces. And so this is historically done over like your aero, your airplane wing, uh, uh -huh. but we're also doing this over terrain. So we actually have 3D models of countries uh, and let's just build very uh, detailed models that helps us basically fill in the gaps between those other two sources I mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're flying, if we have data from a parachute landing where we flew into one of these, uh, we, we will go back we take the data from our plane flying in. We take the weather data from that, you know, from that moment of time, that whatever we can get our hands on. We run that through these sort of macro uh, models of computational fluid dynamics models to predict what was actually happening mm -hmm. basically ahead of where we parachute landed, right? <laughs> the thing we didn't quite get to see. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. and, then, and then that helps us fill in some of the gaps. So this is fascinating because, I mean, this is, this is definitely not a mainstream AI problem that you would find in the research literature. This, but it is exactly the same kind of methodology as you would use for the kind of more commonplace vision and speech problems, it seems. Exactly, exactly. And it's also one of those fun sort of necessity problems, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when we launched in Rwanda and Ghana, this was not our biggest challenge for reliability, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but over time, we've gotten to the point where it is, uh, and now we've been tackling it. Um, and, uh, and we, like you said, we have, because we have this, this historical data, it helps sort of jumpstart that chicken and egg cycle mm -hmm. that we can use that to really, uh, well, sort of mine that for any information that we can use to train mm -hmm. these models. On that note of, of data, is, are there other things that are on your mind for the future where you say, okay, thanks to flying these drones, we have very interesting data that can allow us to build more advanced systems that can do even a better job or something new. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. And I, the, so you, well, already with weather generally, it's something we've been thinking a lot about because mm -hmm. 
our drones sort of represent these flying uh, weather stations that mm -hmm. that are very good. <laughs> uh, very, we, we care a lot about them being precise so our planes fly well, uh, and 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 they and they also capture data that's that's very clean. So if you think about the weather challenge in general, weather forecasting in general. Um, you know, it's it's all about where your data comes from, and if you're collecting data on the ground, that's like the that's like the worst data ever because it's a wind, especially is a, just it's all affected by what's around you, right? So, <laughs> a weather station next to a tree is not as good as a plane, nice in the nice sort of free stream uh -huh. of the air. Um, and we'd love to sort of use that to help with weather forecasting in general. Is that what you're asking, or you you're going more for like internal? Yeah, I, I was thinking just generally kind of things that because you have the data, new ideas that have come to your mind as, you know, opportunities you, you could leverage the data for. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be honest, most of the, most of my efforts of how to use our existing data are really about how to kind of get past the next <laughs> hurdle for the company. Uh, <laughs> and so, so exactly, exactly. Uh, so some <laughs> of the things we've looked at, which are starting to bear, bear fruit are essentially using, so, so we have logs from every flight we've ever done ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, and we've, we've invested quite a bit in the data systems that make, uh, using those logs really um, easy. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, like a lot of what the, the, those logs get used for is like intentional, right? So let's say we have a problem and we use those logs to study data to help us root cause a problem. Another mm -hmm. example of intentional, of course, is a design problem. We want to understand mm -hmm. what are the loads that a wing sees, right? And so we can mm -hmm. look through all of our flight data to get a nice, really good statistical picture of what loads a wing sees. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, there's, there's definitely information in those logs uh, that we don't know to go look for, but there's a fantastic amount of data. And so we've actually, we've been starting to look at basically sort of anomaly detectors to help us flag, like what is weird, right? Mm -hmm. um, which can now be a predictor, sort of a near miss, if you will, signal uh, that, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to have a problem coming and we treat this as a near miss now and we dig into it. Um, we may be able to basically head off a reliability challenge that we don't understand yet. That's sort of an order of magnitude beyond the reliability we are at today, if that makes sense. Right. It seems like you could do preventative maintenance in really nice ways at the scale that you're starting to operate. Exactly. Exactly. We're really excited about that too. Yeah. Going back to, to what you mentioned earlier, the other main application that you're already seeing now for, for deep learning and AI in general, uh, on the image recognition side, and you said something about landing or, or destinations. Can you say a bit about that? Sure, absolutely. So th there's a number of things we're working on. So um, the, let me sort of paint a little bit of a picture. So the first thing we've been working on using AI and perception is around aircraft detection. Uh, and mm -hmm. we actually, we have our first submission into the FAA uh, in November for that, which uh, by the way, fun fact, as far as we know, as far as the FAA people we're working with know, this is the first time the FAA has ever reviewed uh, basically a trained model or an AI, ba based on AI huh. functionality for use in the national airspace. Uh, so this, this will be a, this is a, this is a, this is, I'm saying that for two reasons, because it's not approved yet to be clear, <laughs> but if it is approved, uh, it's a big milestone for the FAA as well, because they're, they're basically uh, sort of learning how to think about this kind of performance-based uh, mm -hmm. way of looking at these problems, um, which is, uh, which it's a big lift. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, to be clear, it's a big lift for them. And I know that because it's a big lift for us, even get, mm -hmm. for us to get the confidence of like, hey, the, we are confident in the safety performance of the system in order to then submit it to them. Just getting that done internally was, was uh, uh, it, it required people better at math than I am. <laughs> well, you got some really great people apparently. Um, now, yeah. when I think about this, I mean, you build a vision system to recognize other aircraft. Um, what does that look like? I mean, how do you build a system to detect other aircraft? Yeah, how do you build a system to detect other aircraft? So uh, the first thing I'll mention is the thing we submitted to the FAA is not what you think it is. It's not vision. I oh. can't tell what it is quite yet, but it's very okay. cool and it works incredibly well. So I'm very excited about Got it. it. But that's that's enough teasing that idea. We we <laughs> actually do have we actually do have vision capabilities in development right now, and those are focused around what we call the delivery experience. So this is finding the spot you know, at your house or your backyard where we can deliver, right? Mm -hmm. the, so we, we, we want to see what we want to find the trees. So we don't put it <laughs> mm -hmm. no, delivery into the trees is a bad mm -hmm. customer experience. Uh, we want to figure out like, where's a good, you know, we don't want to deliver it in your pool. Uh, there's a lot of things like that that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we want to really understand well. Um, and so a lot of that is, uh, you know, it's, it's gathering data from just operations using our sort of existing methods of, of getting operating. Uh, it's, it's, and it's also gathering data sort of by hook and by crook, right? Like, 
<laughs> we, we put, we'll, we'll put a camera payload on a fishing pole or basically a sort of extendo pole and send it home with people to kind of right. build out data sets and, and things like that to help make sure we're getting uh, um, mm-hmm. diversity in our data sets. Uh, and yeah, and then it's just a lot of really understanding the problem uh, and then being really clever about how do we sort of reduce the dimensionality of the problem? How do we make this problem tractable? Right? How do we how do we stop thinking about it as like a brute force, like we're just going to solve the whole thing? To like how do we how do we make this something we can really get our head around, uh, train a network to solve in a way that 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 actually works for the customer and and uh, and makes sense too. That's one of the, the last pieces I think are really important when you're dealing with people. You know, if it doesn't make sense uh, to anybody but the, the AI team, like it's uh-huh. it's not a, it's hard. To, people have to look at it and they have to be like, I want that or I understand that. I get I get what's happening and, and that has to come together in a reasonable way. Now, one thing I'm very curious about, a lot of the challenges of putting AI to work in, in the real world relate to kind of the long tail. Always new things happen. Is that, uh, is that the case? Are you trying to address that? Or you know, does a customer have to satisfy specific requirements ahead of time that you specify before you know, it, it's, it's a place you can deliver? It's very much about the long tail. And this is part of the reason we pushed really hard to find a use case and a customer that we could get operating without requiring AI first. Because what that means is you can kind of think of our AI-based capabilities as essentially adding one of two things, improving our safety case, Mm -hmm. right? Or uh, basically improving our efficiency, uh, Mm -hmm. or in some cases, enabling experiences we couldn't have done otherwise. Um, but when you, so when you think about a safety case, for example, like, so a safety case is sort of this in, in aerospace is this end to end, you know, safe sort of statistical argument about how safe are you? Um, and, uh, and, and there's a lot of ways to solve the problems in that chain, right? And some of, you know, some of them aren't very efficient or aren't very elegant, but you do them anyway, because you want, you, you got to be safe at all times. Mm-hmm. But because we have that baseline today, uh, we're able to layer in these capabilities uh, in ways that enable us to scale while maintaining safety, for example, which is a lot of what we're doing, um, but, but without requiring perfection at the beginning, right? As long as, now it's important that we know how imperfect it is, because otherwise you, you can't stand behind the safety case. But if you know how imperfect it is, you can, you can, you can launch it, you can operate on it, you can learn about it, um, and then you can improve it over time, uh, which improves the safety case, improves your ability to scale. Uh, and that's sort of, you know, we're kind of in that dream situation where, you know, a lot of people describe it similar like Tesla, like Tesla makes plenty of money selling cars and they can use that to then sort of basically improve their cars, if you will, and make them more and more valuable by adding AI based capabilities, which is a great way to enter the market versus having to have an AI capability that just like nails your product on the first go, uh, which is right. well, hard to do. <laughs> you talk about it so concrete about, you know, deliveries and so forth. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, um, could I personally expect a, a drone delivery from Zipline as, just as a consumer, just buying something online? Is, is that something that's on the near horizon here in, let's say, California? I mean, it all depends on your definition of near horizon, but we'll get, get, we'll, we'll get it done. We, uh, we're, we will get that done for sure. It will definitely initially be health related. Um, mm-hmm. And it might be as simple as like you have a telehealth visit and like while the telehealth visit is happening on your phone, like the doctor sends you something directly to your home. Like that's mm-hmm. what it'll be initially uh, to homes mm-hmm. here in the US. Um, and, you know, some things like Walmart, if you're in more remote areas. Uh, and then we're going to go from there and keep like, th- there's this awesome thing happening in the US around healthcare at home, accelerated by COVID. Mm-hmm. And the reason I can say it's awesome is actually Africa's way ahead of us. Europe's way ahead of us. And I've, ex- I've got to experience it myself a few times in my life, mm-hmm. just how cool it is to have really good healthcare at home whenever you can. Uh, mm-hmm. And you know, here in the States, it's going to happen too. And we want to be a really big part of accelerating it because it's just, it's just so much better. It's so much better. Yeah, well, I look forward to that. Um, I, I definitely know about the discrepancies between <laughs> healthcare in US and Europe. It's a, a lot of gaps there. Um, now, when a lot of people think about drones, I think the most natural thing they still think about today is DJI drones, because those are the, the toys yeah. that you buy and, and you have fun with, and it's a consumer product, right? Yeah. And so, so I'm kind of curious, how you see the, the broader kind of landscape, um, you know, w- what's happening with, with drones beyond what's happening at Zipline and what are some exciting things that are happening? I mean, the, the most exciting thing that's happening with drones at Zipline and elsewhere is really around autonomy, 
right? It's, it's really around these systems being able to take care of a lot of the basics of like, don't hit things. Uh, mm -hmm. And whether it's, whether it's a drone, like what, uh, you know, Skydio makes, which is sort of a DJI that basically has a lot of autonomy in it. So you could basically, mm -hmm. it's very hard to crash it and almost impossible. Mm -hmm. and it just flies itself. Um, and those kind of capabilities for, uh, for all manner of things, the, 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 the mm -hmm. Skydio has this amazing product out for insurance adjusters, where basically you walk up to a house, you push a button, and it gives you like a, you know, this like, you know, t super high resolution and imagery of the roof without, you know, in, in a matter of seconds, you don't fly it, it just flies itself. Wow. Uh, and so there's really cool stuff happening from companies like that uh, around for industries like that. Uh, so take here in California, right? PG&E is like, you know, has this huge problem with uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> starting fires, right? Uh, yeah. And, you know, yeah. last year they're like, look, we have, I forget what the number was, you know, I think it's, millions of, of, of kilometers of, of power lines, or maybe hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands, just a fantastically large number, way more than you can expect with, with helicopters, which is what they used to do. And they came to the drone industry and said, hey, can, you, can we do this at scale, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we're at the cusp of saying yes, right? We, we, and that really comes back to things like autonomy, you know, mm -hmm. being really good at sort of the range and, and those kind of capabilities. And, uh, and of course, once we unlock these, you know, then the, the awesome next step that's going to happen, I'm very confident in our lifetime is the flying car step, right? Oh. We're, we're going to start, we're going to start commuting and, and flying drones and, and that's going to be awesome too. Yeah. I mean, I think that that for a lot of people will probably the most uh, impact, biggest change in, in their day-to-day -day life. If they, if they fly to work instead of drive to work, though, a lot of people working from home, of course, now, but um, it, just think about commuting in 3D instead of on, on the roads. Um, it's going to be so fun. It's going to be so great and so quick. It's, it's going to change everything. The flying cars are going to change the, the economies in really big ways. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you yeah. say a bit more? Well, just think of the basics of just home prices, right? Like, you know, but, you know if, if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, for example, right? If you're sort of near the big companies, your home prices is twice as much as you are if you're 20, 30 miles away. But when I say 20, 30 miles away, I mean like as the drone flies, right? Mm -hmm. And like uh, you can buy a house for literally half the cost. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that drone flight will take you all of like 10 minutes. Uh, but driving through the highway system can take you an hour and a half. So people will pay for that really expensive house mm -hmm. instead, of do, instead of live over the other side of the hills or whatever it might be. What I'm personally very curious about, but related to the applications you mentioned, and curious if you've seen anything, is um, fire prevention and firefighting. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the firefighting is really exciting because you know, the, the, just the tanker style operations, being able to do that without people in those in those planes is going to be. Uh, it's, I mean, it's just it's a, it's an incredibly dangerous thing to have people flying these tankers into fires, um, going in and doing inspection for spot like looking for hot spots. Also, really powerful to do with drones. Uh, this is one thing that I. This is one thing that happens. I, I think in, th there's a company. Boeing has a company that does this uh, for firefighters at scale here in California. It's not very well oh. advertised, uh, but they, they will fly these drones that are designed for military surveillance into the fires to look for hot spots. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, it really helps the firefighters know what's happening in the fire and, and fire f fight the fire much uh, faster and, and more safely. Now, it seems like. Those are things we've all imagined they're going to be part of our future. And maybe the big question, at least on my mind, is, you know, when you talk about these applications, what, what kind of timelines do you think? Because I think we've all seen the Jetsons with flying cars and we know 100 years from now, sure. But what do you think? It's a great question. I, I, drone delivery to homes in the U.S., you know, it's, it's, it's going to start this year. I, I, I think I'm almost 100% oh, wow. sure of it. Wow. Uh, this will be in re more remote locations. Um, I think the more, the more dense locations, you know, three, four years feels very practical wow. to me. Um, mm -hmm. th that's where the technology is. And I think I th I'm, I'm reasonably confident that's where the regulators will be here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, I think flying cars, like flying cars have a, have a, have a longer road to hoe, but I, if that took 20 years, I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised if it took that long. I think it's more like the 10 year time frame uh, for a number of reasons. Um, I think there's a, there's a chance 20 years of time frame for like where the, where the economics become make it mainstream and 10 mm -hmm. years is, is sort of a more of like a premium service. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's not that much technologically in the way anymore of flying cars. Uh, batteries today are good enough and they're just getting better. Uh, learning how to fly in this kind of weather is something that well, people like us are like really learning how to master um, the safety and the safety for the safety systems around it. Like it's, it's, 
in a lot of ways, it's, it's, you know, more tractable for, from an autonomy perspective than, you know, well, an autonomous car on the road, right. Mm-hmm. For a lot of reasons. Well, just to be clear, when you said flying is something people like us are mastering, you, you mean, th- is it going to be automated or are you, you saying that people are going to be actively flying? No, I, I mean, well, the very early flying car stuff that people will be flying those, uh, but that's, I, I think that's more from a regulatory sort of uh, kind of walk, crawl, run than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, w- when I say people are mastering, I mean companies like Zipline are getting really good at flying in this kind of weather, uh, in this kind of in this sort of low altitude, like how to fly reliably. Um, and I think that w- w- in the long run, you know, autonomy is going to win there. There's, 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 as as my pilot friend is always saying, you know, when you look at when you look at the cockpit in his little in his in his little <laughs> two seater. Mm-hmm. most of the buttons there, he has to remind himself not to push because if he does, like, you know, bad things will happen, right? <laughs> yes. uh, and, and it turns out that, like, uh, you know, this, and this is something that Zipline has gotten very good at is the, the autonomy, like, what we think we call it the low-level autonomy. This is like, the, we call it like sort of the, even at that health and status of like, hey, you have a problem with this part of your hardware. What are you going to do about it? Like, we have software systems that are very good at doing the right thing about that. And they're not, they're good at it. They do it in a fraction of a second. They make the, the right decision in a fraction of a second. And, and they're, they're, you know, they're auditable. They have all the features you want uh, that, that, that the regulators want, but don't know they need yet. Um, and mm-hmm. to do this at scale. And so um, I think that's going to be a big part of it is, is uh, well, is basically, you know, you have to learn this. It's all a learning process. Uh, and, and I don't see anything technologically sort of fundamentally blocking flying cars. I, it's just, it, it's just, it's, it's basically already here. Um, and once the batteries get a little bit better, it's going to be here in a cheap way too. That's very exciting. Uh, yeah. Much looking forward to that. Me too. Now, another thing I'm really curious about you, I mean, we talked a lot about Zipline, but you also did another company before, Willow Garage. And I believe between Willow Garage and Zipline, you were part of a few other startups. And so I'm kind of curious. Zooming out, um, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, d- did love to start a company. And, and it, it generally seems a great way to have a lot of impact in the world by starting a company versus joining an existing company. Can you, can, well, do you have some advice that uh, you can share from your experiences? My high level advice on startups is pretty simple. Like, do it because you have to, Right. Like if someone has to talk you into doing it, don't do it. You won't enjoy it because it's hard, but you, and you will enjoy the hard if it's something that you really have to do. I, I mean, you have to do it like you just like you can't control yourself, right? You're just really excited <laughs> to go do that. Uh, that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is, is, you know, customers first, right? And it, literally, especially if you're a technology company. So many technology companies make the excuse of like, ah, there's too much technology to do here. I need to make some demos or whatever before finding the customer. I have come to believe that like that is never true. Like it doesn't matter how complex your technology is. If you find customers first and then develop the product based on that technology with those customers, like the, everything gets easier. When I say everything, I literally mean, you know, the investors. I mean, most investors want to invest in customers, right? If you have customers, mm-hmm. investment comes. Mm-hmm. Hiring great people. Like most, to, if you want to inspire someone to join your crazy adventure and you can talk about an actual customer with an actual need that you really understand, that will inspire people to join you. Um, product decisions, technical decisions, what you can cut and what you can't, right? If, that's, if those debates in your company are anchored in actual customers you can literally go visit and get to know, those decisions become easy. Like literally all the hard parts of a startup become much, much, much easier if it's all guided by those customers. Um, and uh, yeah, I find if you do those two things, it's almost hard to screw up. You know, if you're really listening to your customers, don't get me wrong. As a geek, it's easy to act, think, you know, talk, convince yourself you're listening to your customer or not. Uh, but if you really listen to them and are willing to like, you know, let them drag you a bit, uh, and I don't mean like go ask them like, what do you want? But go really understand their problem and like let that process of understanding their problem, you know, guide you off of your initial course. Like you, you, you'll be successful. It's, I, it's, it's, it's all like success is almost guaranteed if you really listen to the customer. Keenan, it's been absolutely wonderful to have you on. It's been far too long since we got to catch up. Um, and I'm absolutely stunned by the tremendous impact Zipline has had saving lives. Hard to imagine a better story of robotics being taken out of research labs into the real world. 
If oh, anyone, thank you, Peter. This has been absolutely fantastic. It's so cool to catch up. And it, well, anyway, it's also just been so fun to follow both your lab work and your startup work. And uh, it's very inspiring and uh, well, literally educational. <laughs> we read your papers. Well, I'm sure you managed to educate a lot of people listening in today. Um, but now if anybody listening in just like me would like to keep learning even more from Keenan, I highly recommend checking out the company's website, flyzipline.com. And also highly recommend following Keenan on Twitter, where he uh, tends to share Zipline's latest innovations and impact that's being achieved. On Twitter, that's at Keenan Weiroback. And the same goes for LinkedIn. Thanks again, Keenan. Cool. Thank you.